Good morning and welcome to each one of you. Uh, we will get started with today's uh, session uh, to learn about the book of Hebrews. We were in Hebrews chapter 7. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Uh, Charles, would you be able to lead us? Yes, I would. Let's pray. Yeah, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done in our lives. But most importantly, bringing your word to be able to get the complete revelation for us to live a life that pleases you. And as we set our minds and our hearts to study the book of Hebrews, uh, beginning from chapter 7, Lord, we pray that you will come and be amidst us, regardless of the geographical distances. But Lord Jesus, you who promised that when two or three have gathered in my name, I will be in their midst. Lord, we trust that you are in our midst, for your promises are true. Come, have your way in our lives, and teach us, so that we will be able to edify the church that you have entrusted us with. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Charles. Um, let's get back into Hebrews chapter 7. So uh, I hope, uh, you know, you remember uh, something of what we discussed in the last class. And um, if, if at all there is anything that, you know, you um, have learned and it's it's been a blessing to you, maybe we can start with sharing a few key things uh, from what you've understood and you were blessed by and then uh, you know i'll take it forward so i'm leaving this time open for you to just share you know um, your learnings Hi, Pastor Nancy. Sorry, I just Hi. joined. No, that's yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so what what you wanted us to share? Uh, so we've discussed, uh, you know, several things. So basically, I was saying uh, from Hebrews chapter seven uh, or Hebrews chapter six, the last class. If there's anything, any one thing that stands out for you, you could share. So okay. uh, that that is what I was saying. But I mean, if there's anything else from the other chapters also that's okay but we can start with sharing a little bit and then i will get into the class sure sure pastor yeah uh yes sasha um knowing that in the book of Hebrews 7 that jesus was uh King of Righteous and also he is a King of Peace. And Melchizedek is a type of Jesus. And how he was, um, he came to fulfill what God has uh, established that, that Jesus is going to be our priest forever. And then he was a perfect sacrifice. And can uh, say, like he was the hope um uh, he was the hope and the anchor for our soul that and he is also the steadfast and he was uh, we are the worshipers of truth and spirit and we have to exp express in the way like um not just how we live but how we set up, set up an example for other believers Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Asha, for sharing your uh, learning. And uh, yes, we, we touched upon many of those key things in the last couple of uh, sessions. Uh, Kennedy is saying uh, priesthood in relation to Melchizedek. OK, uh, uh, Kennedy, I, uh, I just want to check with you. Is that a question uh, that you have, or you're just stating that this is something that we learned? Uh, tithing and 
Okay, it's not a question. So yeah, we talked about priesthood uh, according to the order of Melchizedek, how Jesus is appointed as a priest and how he is a priest forever uh, and that nothing will change him. Other priests used to be, uh, you know, replaced after that term. But uh, thank God we know our high priest uh, and he will be there for us forever and represent us in the presence of God. And uh, Kennedy, uh, you also state tithing and its essence. So is that a question or is that a comment? OK, so yeah, of course, we saw how uh, uh, Abraham gave a tenth of you know, uh, a tenth to uh, Melchizedek and uh, uh, thereby even the descendants, right? Like who, uh, who were to come, which is Aaron and all the priests, they have tithed to a greater high priest um, uh, and uh, that states that he is, uh, you know, that Melchizedek was greater. And now we are learning that Jesus is a, is a high priest forever in the order of this great uh, high priest, Melchizedek, who was the uh, uh, priest of the great God. Okay, uh, so uh, I'll come to the comments uh, uh, a bit later. Tarun, uh, did you want to say something? I saw your hand raised. Yeah, I just, yeah, I yeah. was just trying sure. to recall the last. Uh, Week yeah. we had a good discussion on falling away. I was just yes. studying about it, and I said, uh, uh, ah. "Falling away is more of like when you fall away to apostasy, is the wrong teaching. It's going to be difficult to come back. Like you now, when uh, along with every promise, there is some kind of a, a small responsibility of ours attached to it. For example, Jesus says." Uh, you know, nobody can steal away the sheep from my sheep and uh, you are protected. But he also says that my sheep hears my voice. Like you hear someone else's voice by choice and you walk away, then it's it's your responsibility. So here uh, the author is writing to the Hebrews who are actually uh, behind the rituals, which are divinely appointed, which are all, he's also uh, writing to someone who is behind divinely appointed priests and, div uh, and they are also behind a divinely appointed place a temple uh, now it, it's a, it, it's an extraordinary debate <laughs> like where he is presenting that you know even before levi was born uh, there was Melchizedek and uh, Jesus was even before <laughs> Melchizedek and so he can be a priest so their their problem is he's not a levite why is he a priest <laughs> So he's he's defending that point because uh, as a Jew, uh, only a Levite can be a priest. Jesus is a lion of Judah. <laughs> he's not a Levite. Why is he a priest? And Arthur is giving a very uh, an excellent argument, saying that if Melchizedek can be a priest, uh, Jesus was even before. Yes, he can be a priest. So uh, when we look in through the context, it's actually coming out very clearly that everything is better. Is like is better than the angels, better than the law, better than the prophets, and uh, it's a good argument that he is presenting across. Well, very profound uh, points there, uh, Tarun, and you put it also so uh, wonderfully. Thank you so much for sharing. It uh, enhances, enriches our understanding of uh, you know the uh, different uh, chapters that we've learned so far, and particularly uh, with regard to Melchizedek and how Jesus is a better high priest and so well qualified. Uh, and that's true, and that's that's what the author is trying to do. He's trying to. Uh, reveal to these Jews that uh, they must not be, yes, they have an understanding that has come to them through the law, uh, but they must not get stuck in it because the law which was presented to, to them uh, was just a you know, shadow of the greater things to come. And when the greater is here and they are still stuck in what, you know, is, is uh, we, we will see later, uh, yeah, yeah, there's the use of this word obsolete as well, something that is old and is sort of now uh, gone away and, and the new has taken its position. These believers need to hold on to uh, what is the real thing, right? The fulfillment of the law. So 
he'll continue to emphasize this and uh, encourage the believers so here in our uh, comments uh, abinash he oh, one second I think I missed Divya's. Yeah, Divya uh, said the need to be spiritually mature and grow in maturity towards Jesus Christ. That's true. We saw that uh, uh, in Hebrews 5. Then uh, Aminash says, now through Jesus Christ, we have an assurance that he is a guarantee of the covenant. Yes. So uh, there would be uh, mediators of, uh, you know, uh, like the high priest, in a way, they would mediate the uh, rituals in the temple. But then we see here that Jesus is also the surety. As a high priest, he's become a surety or a guarantee of the covenant. And that is special. Uh, okay. Then Abinas also adds, Abraham gave tithe to Melchizedek as honor and worship. And Abraham is giving tight to Melchizedek means it's showing the greatness of Melchizedek. Okay, that's true. Yeah, so establishing once again that uh, G Melchizedek is great and uh, thereby, you know, Jesus is greater than Melchizedek. All right. So now uh, let's move ahead with what we have here. I think we stopped at uh, verse 25, which says that uh, Jesus is able to save to the uttermost. And yes. Yeah. So I, I mentioned mediator of the covenant. So mediator of the covenant, uh, yeah, so we, we would consider Moses, you know, rather than the high priest, we would actually consider Moses as the mediator of the covenant because he received it and then, you know, he um, gave it out to the people to follow. So he's the mediator of the covenant. But in the pas passage of Hebrews 7, we also saw that Jesus has become a guarantee or a surety. Or we could look at it this way. He has become a like a co-signer of the covenant, one part of the covenant, right? It it depends on Jesus, but that was not the case with Moses. Moses wasn't, uh, you know, he he was not a, a a guarantee, or you know, he was not doing anything to make the covenant stand uh, as such. But we know that Jesus is a, a surety or a guarantor of this covenant that also is a great encouragement for us now let's continue from verse 26 uh, there are a couple of verses in 7 and then you know we will jump to 8 so 26 to 28 uh, if someone can read we can discuss this can i read question yes asha yes. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men and their weakness as high priest. But the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Thank you, Asha. So uh, as if whatever we discussed so far was not good enough to understand that Jesus is uh, better qualified as a priest, that he's a uh, you know high priest appointed according to the order of uh, Melchizedek uh, and all of that. Now he's adding a few more features to the uh, high priestly role that Jesus carries. Uh, he's saying that Jesus is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners and become higher than the heavens. So uh, basically he's pointing out that the character of Jesus compared to any earthly high priest. You know, it is far superior because you couldn't find a high priest who 
was uh, uh, very virtuous and in addition to being virtuous has become higher than the heaven so you know there is no comparison here of an earthly high priest and he also you know says that um, uh, these high priests in their service right uh, daily they were offering up sacrifices we know the the uh, property of the sacrifices was to first provide cleansing for that high priest and then the high priest could could go in and uh, take charge of all the other duties which were given to uh, him so here one thing that we know about jesus is that he did not have to uh, do these things because he was sinless okay so that's another advantage so he really did not have to offer up daily sacrifices to uh, provide himself an entry into the presence of god he in fact he offered up himself so you notice there that's uh, the beauty of what we are discussing earlier the high priest would give something else you know as uh, uh, an offering for sin but here we have a high priest who is virtuous who is exalted in heaven who need not provide daily sacrifices and the precious thing is that the high priest is also the sacrifice so it's it's beyond what the uh, jewish believer could could even digest so we're talking about a high priest who is so great but he himself has become the sacrifice which high priest you tell me would uh, you know would shed their blood in order for us to receive uh, cleansing but here you have a high priest who gave himself up so high priest and sacrifice at the same time then moving on verse 28 uh, he says that uh, the law it appointed uh, human beings and obviously you know human beings with flaws with uh, things that they they needed forgiveness for uh, and so he uses the term weakness there who have weakness but you know we have the son of god now who has been appointed as uh, a priest with an oath and notice another very very important thing so we've seen all the qualifiers for jesus but here one more uh, which is added in this verse is he has been perfected forever perfected forever priest forever uh, exalted above the heavens perfected forever offered himself up you know he's become a sacrifice so the uh, uh you know it should have it should have really uh, helped the jewish believer value uh, jesus much higher and better than any other high priest that they knew so we will continue to talk about jesus's high priestly ministry in the passages to follow now there is a sort of a continue, continuation or a common thread in Hebrews 8, 9 and uh, also you know 10 you would, you would notice that. So we may not so much dwell uh, you know on, on uh, uh, phrases and uh, words as we did earlier but this is more like when we read in entirety what this is saying we'll get the understanding of what the author means so we might go a little quicker uh, in in these chapters so can we begin by reading hebrews chapter 8 verses 1 through 6 please so someone can pick it up i can read yes can I read? yes please do Okay, Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 through 6. Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer 
offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it's necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and the shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant which was established as better on better promises. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Charles. Thank you for uh, reading this uh, for us. So we continue to look at the high priestly ministry of the Lord Jesus. Uh, and we see that as a high priest, he is now seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. So where is his position now? He is no longer serving in an earthly temple or a tabernacle uh, which has been established, but he is now seated in heaven. So that is, if you want to look at it this way, that's his office, okay, from where he's functioning. He's right now, Jesus is right now in heaven at the right hand of the Father. And he's seated, uh, uh, you know, Okay, that is fine. And then we uh, also see here that he is a minister of the sanctuary and the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. So we must understand that when God wanted Moses to make a tabernacle, the tabernacle was actually a picture of the heavenly worship okay, or the way worship uh, happens in heaven so there is this place where god dwells and uh, uh, for us to worship him in the right manner you know there there is a me there is a proper channel through which we must approach him and so when moses set up the tabernacle it was actually a shadow and it was actually a picture and it was telling people how they must approach the presence of God and bring him worship. So uh, in that sense, you know, he's using the word here. He says, sanctuary, true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. So the actual temple is a place where God dwells, where God's presence dwells. And we know that that place is heaven where, you know, God's throne is. And that is called as the sanctuary or the true tabernacle. So we have the heavenly tabernacle, which is the actual tabernacle, the real tabernacle. But what God did is God, to help man understand worship, God gave Moses this entire picture and said, you go ahead and you build a tabernacle in this way. So. You know, there was this outer court and the inner court. And then man had to approach by uh, making pr uh, provision for the forgiveness of his sins through sacrifices, through offerings, gifts. And then he comes inside, approaches the presence of God. And there again, you know, many things were symbolic, symbolic, uh, uh, the, the blood on the Ark of the Covenant, uh, which was symbolic of the redemptive blood. We are going to talk about it later. So God actually gave Moses a pattern and the picture or a shadow of the true tabernacle or sanctuary. And who built this true tabernacle? We are told here that the Lord himself has erected this tabernacle. Okay. Uh, so how do we look at what is being stated here? We see that Jesus is the fulfillment of the priesthood which is which was established in the earthly tabernacle. So whatever 
was done here on earth there is finally a fulfillment of that and that has been accomplished through the lord jesus so jesus is the high priest seated in heaven uh, and he is the minister of the sanctuary or the true tabernacle okay verse 3 here again there is this uh, mention of the uh, levitical priesthood and the uh, sacrifices that they offered for sin but jesus himself has now become a sacrifice okay so that uh, is also something that we have talked about so moving on to verses 4 uh we read here that uh, okay moses okay, moses uh, was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle and so that you know we have understood the pattern through which he actually made uh, the tent of worship and in verse 6 we notice again that uh, because of all these things uh, jesus has a more excellent ministry okay and he is also the mediator of the covenant but then we are told that this covenant is better this covenant has better promises for us so uh, we could continue you know in uh, looking at the upcoming verses all right yeah so let's continue from verse 7 we can read all the way till verse 13 shall i read ma'am yes abhi for if that first covenant had been faultless then no place would have been sought for a second because finding fault with them he says Behold the days are coming says the Lord when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they did not continue in my covenant and I disregarded them says the Lord for this is the covenant that i will make with the house of israel after those days says the lord i will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts and i will be their god and they shall be my people none of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother saying know the lord for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. In that he says a new covenant. He has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Amen. Yes, thank you, Abhi. Thank you for reading that. Um, so once again, you know, we notice here that uh, there's something better about uh, the ministry of Jesus and the covenant which he has made. We just saw that it's a better covenant with better promises. Uh, we are told that there was a need for a new covenant uh, because the old covenant had certain loopholes. Okay, so that is the reason God really wanted to bring in something new, something better for the people. Uh, just a moment. So some of the older covenants that we could uh, uh, think of were the covenant which God made with Abraham. Then, of course, there were the covenant, the covenant which uh, was. brought to the people through moses uh, it it had a redemptive nature in it we know that god made a covenant with david so these are all uh, you know it was called the davidic covenant uh, which was also another step in god's redemptive plan but ultimately god's uh, greatest plan of redemption was fulfilled through the new covenant because in the new covenant there was uh, this this uh, this promise of god uh, for the shedding of the blood of our 
Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the, the blood of the Lamb which was shed in the new covenant for the forgiveness of our sins. So it's sort of the fulfillment, you know, of... Uh, uh, fulfillment of god's redemptive plan the earlier covenants could not do that they could cover sin to some extent but nothing could take away sin nothing could cleanse our sins and make us eligible for the blessings of salvation uh, which is what the new covenant was able to do for us and that's why you know he's saying the older covenants if they were faultless then you know there would be no need of a new covenant but there was a need for the new covenant because we needed something you know that will cleanse us that would make us partakers of the uh, full blessings of god and so something new was brought in so this word new um, you know in the greek it is uh, it describes newness as regards to uh, time newness uh, you know with regards to something that god is doing as well um, and there's another word called kainos okay which is used in the new covenant and this new uh, as we saw earlier yes it refers to a new time but even in terms of quality something to do with a new quality um, in what God is offering us. So God was interested in giving us something substantially different and new through the new covenant. Okay. Um, and later in verse 9, we see that you know God talks about the fact that He didn't make a covenant with uh, the with Israel, but they were not obedient to God, which was disappointing for him which was displeasing to god and uh, uh, this could be you know another reason uh you know it, it's not like god decided after israel's disobedience that you know he will bring in uh, the new covenant through jesus he always had a plan for the full redemption of mankind but you know the the fact that israel was disobedient to the old covenant uh, also in a sense is asking for a new covenant okay so uh, that's what he is uh, fitting into what he's saying right now and verses 10 and 11 uh, he is saying that you know he will make a new covenant with the people that he will uh, put his laws on the minds and the hearts of his people that he will be their god so this is the kind of covenant that he is making with the people the new covenant and the better one where uh, you know god is saying that it will be not just about hearing the rules because that is what the old covenant uh, told us that these are the rules, these are the guidelines, one must keep them. But what will the new covenant do? He's saying that the new covenant, um, it actually features transformation from within. That's the point where God is saying, I will put the law you know, in the mind, in the hearts. So something to do with transformation with within and not simply uh, externally regulating by the law uh, this is also talking about you know god uh, imprint his heart on our hearts so that when when we uh, think with think about god and, uh, and his purposes his plans we now would like to have the heart of God, you know, what does he want? What pleases God? You know, think that way rather than, okay, let's do the right thing because that is what the law requires of us. So imprinting uh, his, his, his uh, purposes, his plans, his standards upon our hearts. And also, you know, as we see the kind of new covenant that God was talking about, it's, uh, a redemptive co covenant it uh, is a covenant of greater intimacy we will see you know uh, later on as well how we now have been brought near to god so near by the work which jesus has done for us and uh, this is a covenant that does a deeper work of cleansing and not just a covering of sin you know which the old covenant had to offer so 
he, if he's just trying to put all this together when he's saying that God will write his laws on our hearts and no one needs to te teach one another, you know, that, uh, uh, okay, come on, follow God. But it's going to be a heart thing. It's going to be something that will uh, work from a place of inward transformation. So verses 12 and 13, now he says, for I will be merciful to their unrighteous and their sins and their laws, lawless deeds I will remember no more. In that he says, a new covenant he has made, the first obsolete. Now that, now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So uh, he is talking about this new covenant now overtaking all the old uh, the old covenant. So when we say old covenant, there I have listed out a couple of things, right? And uh, primarily what Moses brought to the people, he's saying that the first one, right? The first one is now made obsolete or it has become old. And the new covenant is what has now been brought to the four so the old covenant is has vanished and we have to take up the new covenant okay so um yeah new covenant was inaugurated by the lord jesus uh, and the old covenant is now obsolete so we'll have to uh, base our lives on the new covenant there's a lot of comparisons here about the old and the new covenant uh, if you want i can just uh, quickly go over that so comparisons uh, such as you know the old covenant it's a covenant of works and we know that people had to live up to a certain standard to um, uh, be approved of god but under the new covenant uh, we we know that it is because of the works of Jesus on the cross of Calvary that we are now saved. We are saved uh, by faith. We are saved through grace. Uh, and our works are and uh, you know, it is, it is a demonstration of this transformation that has taken place in us. So our works are not necessarily what we do to, uh, to reestablish our relationship with God, but they are more of an outworking okay so under the old uh, covenant the sacrifices were imperfect uh, which is why you had a repetition of the sacrifices but under the new covenant we have jesus christ himself who has become the perfect sacrifice so there no longer is a requirement for repeated sacrifices the way it was done earlier. Under the old covenant, we know that the law was written on tablets or on stones. But in the new covenant, by the Spirit, you know, God writes His law or His heart upon our hearts. So that is another difference. Um, the old covenant, we would say that it sort of brought the people a sense of bondage okay uh it it was obviously not in a negative sense because god wanted them to do the right thing so that they can experience his good he, the, his continued uh goodness however there was always uh, a sort of a restriction because they had to go by the law okay uh but we see under the new covenant there is a sense of true liberty now because uh, jesus has come and he has broken us free from the laws that moses gave us so there's a sense of liberty under the new covenant under the old covenant the holy spirit and his work uh, that was evident but the uh, sort of the um, empowering of the spirit okay was uh, very specific so uh, we know that the anointing was uh, specific to kings to priests to prophets but 
under the new covenant a beautiful thing is that the holy spirit is given to all believers so that is what uh, you know the author is actually saying he's saying it's a better covenant it has better promises all these all these things are what tell us that this is really a better covenant and that it has better promises so yeah just a couple of things that i pointed out um uh, if there is anything anything more that you can think of how the new covenant is a better covenant maybe you can you can uh, share your thoughts and then we can go to uh, chapter 9 here yes sister please go ahead ma'am only to add a few points we are say, here it is read that we are reading that for if that first covenant had been faultless there would have been no need to look for a second one seventh verse eighth chapter here we don't have to take that word faulty or uh, faultless literally because in eighth verse it says god find fa finds fault with them when he says the way the people were not able to keep up the standards but uh, according to the first covenant god has accomplished the what the first covenant he desired that people would understand that they could not fulfill the law in their own strength those in the old testament the saints who had fulfilled to a certain extent the purposes and the will of god only with the strength of god special anointing whenever they went out of it they failed but we the old covenant has uh, made it very clear that we need a we need god to fulfill god's commands and we are helpless so with that understanding when man really understood that he could not fulfill the law of god without god's strength god has in his right time god has put uh, came uh, given us this new covenant in christ through jesus christ that we may with god's help with the help of the holy spirit god that law is written in our heart and this law is replaced by love we do everything we do because we love the lord not because it is a something a order given by god and with great difficulty we are doing it but this is propelled by love love of god because i love god i want to please god i want to fulfill this command not because i want to gain something because already what i have god has given me everything we, he has made us his children and given us this privilege of fulfilling the law in the new covenant just wanted to share ma'am thank you thank you sister thank you so much for uh, sharing and yes uh, under the new covenant we are now the children of god and you know we have an inheritance so it's somewhat different from the way uh, it was for israel you know under the old covenant sister just coming back to that point you made about the old covenant and uh, uh, as the author you know puts it here if if it had no fault so when we talk about the faults of the old covenant we are not saying that uh, you know it was it was uh, bad but the implication is more like it was powerless in itself uh, people could make use of its power if they fulfilled it if they kept the laws but that they couldn't do and it was powerless in the sense that it could not uh, cleanse the sins of mankind it could cover it but it, it could not cleanse and make them a new person so it in those terms you know this whole terminology fault it was more to indicate that it was powerless uh, uh, and uh, you know we're not saying that uh, it was something that uh, uh, god was you know uh, how how do i put it like 
God, Jesus came to uh, completely destroy because there are other instances, for example, in uh, Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and uh, 18. I'll read only uh, verse 17 for us. It says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So as Sister Rupa rightly pointed out, uh, once the new has been brought in, that is the fulfillment of all things old. Okay, So in that sense, the old now is obsolete and the uh, new is what is being enforced. Uh, and yeah, so I just wanted to add that uh, point. Uh, anything else uh, that helps us see that this new covenant is a better one? So please feel free. You can share your thoughts. Yeah, just wanted to add one small yes. point uh, that uh, uh, only someone who finishes the work uh, is sits. Uh, here it says, like, who is seated at the right hand of the throne. Like, uh, when you finish the work, you go and sit. When God gave a model, like, you know, we, we were working on the shadow and now we met the substance. So there's a great transition that happened. And the shadow of the tabernacle of what is in heaven, when God gave it to us, he did not give any seat for the high priest in the tabernacle to sit. He goes in, comes out every year. He has to do an atonement for sins, not, not just for the people outside, but for himself as well. First, he does a sacrifice for himself because he is at fault and he walks in and he does an atonement and then he, uh, uh, it continues every year. It can only hold for one year. But when Jesus did the sacrifice, that's the perfect sacrifice. And uh, that's where he obtained that uh, position as a high priest. And I think Hebrews is the only book which presents Jesus as the high priest. And uh, that the very reason that is being presented is again to uh, bring in the difference to the uh, Hebrews, uh, the Hellenistic Jews who uh, went away, who were holding on to the Jewish traditions, explaining them that uh, Jesus is better than everything that they already know. Uh, they, they know that what a priest means. And now that when they see Jesus as high priest, uh, they, they can see the whole Old Testament through Christ. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Tarun. Thank you so much for uh, adding those uh, points as well. Uh, uh, Asha has something to share here in the chat. In the old covenant, they were not able to talk to God directly. In the new covenant, because of what Jesus has done, we can directly go to God and talk uh, to him freely, heart to heart towards the Heavenly Father. Sure. So yes, Asha, that is true as well, because now we can directly enter, uh, you know, in the Holy of Holies and we have access to God's throne room. So we praise and thank God for what Jesus has done and uh, all uh, the new covenant as well as the better promises that we have in him. So uh, let's go in for a break right now. We shall come back and uh, we'll go to Hebrews chapter 9. So uh, I'll meet you all at 10 a.m. So let's come back in, an, in 10 minutes. Thank you.